I reignited seven different viruses in my body in three strands of Lyme, and it was all stress. And when I was able to unpack that, that's what made me realize and find the literature. I'm like, what happened? I was fine yesterday and I can't raise my hand today because I ended up with neuropathy, liver damage, and brain encephalitis. I cannot emphasize enough how deleteriously destructive stress is. Welcome back to the Essentially You podcast, all about reinventing your health with safer, cheaper, more effective natural solutions and powerful lifestyle changes so that you can become the CEO of your health. I am your host, Dr. Marisa Snyder. Today, we are going to look at a groundbreaking approach to the way that you eat, and not just how you eat, but how you go beyond nutrition to achieve ultimate health which is what I think we are all truly looking for. Did you know that your genetics can dictate which foods you should and should not be eating right now? This groundbreaking research is exactly what my dear friend and podcast guest, Terry Cochran, has figured out after working with thousands of people through creating bio-individualized nutrition plans after studying their genetic profile. Terry has literally cracked the code to figuring out how you should eat for your individual body. I know you're going to love this episode as much as I do. Terry is a wealth of information and she has the results to back it up. Now, before I bring Terry on, I want to quickly sing her praises. Terry has helped to transform the lives of thousands of people from state of illness and imbalance to successful healing and better health through her private practice. She has dedicated herself to ongoing research to get to the root of each and every one of her clients' health needs. Terry's practice offers counseling for adults as well as children and infants. Her team has developed proprietary methodologies that blend the latest in cutting-edge science, epigenetics, biomechanics, and nutrition to create bio-individualized plans for their clients. Terry is also the author of The Wildarian Diet, available on Amazon. Welcome, Terry Cochran, to the Essentially You podcast. Oh, I am so excited to have you here today. I'm so excited to be with you and your audience. We are going to be talking about something that I am super excited about because you are truly an expert in having this conversation. We always think about nutrition being the end-all, be-all, but the topic we're going to be diving into is how to look beyond nutrition, which so many people don't really consider when they are taking care of their bodies. Yes, I really think that's so important important because diet is such a hot topic these days. And typically when people think about diet, they immediately start getting nervous and hot around the collar because diet by its very nature has to do with a limitation or something that you're going to be without. And so the reason why we look beyond nutrition is that I now have defined or redefined diet to encompass everything that we consume in life, not just our food how we consume our thoughts, how we consume the environment around us, how we consume the people in our lives in terms of how we relate to them and they relate to us. So diet, we want to move it from something that's been generally thought of as restrictive and limiting to a thought pattern of abundance and joy because it's going to shift the energetic vibration around that word And therefore, it really moves it beyond nutrition. Oh my goodness. I am so excited that we're going to dive into this. Now, specifically, although you talk a lot about beyond nutrition, I know we've known each other for a couple of years now, but you have developed a program and really a way of life called Wildatarian. And I want to know, one, how did you develop this? How did you get into this field? Because I know once upon a time, you did something very different back in the day. And there was something, some impetus that really moved you in this direction. Indeed, I did something quite different. I had a 20-year career as a commercial real estate finance specialist, a bankruptcy specialist. And my last 10 years in the corporate world, I ran a department within Freddie Mac's multifamily division. So I was truly a risk manager. But when my son was born by the age of three, We were told to prepare for brain seizures. He wasn't talking. He wasn't walking. He was significantly failing to thrive. And after availing ourselves of all the top doctors in the metro Washington, D.C. area, which is where I continue to live, he was only getting worse. And so I decided to shift my risk-managing 
mindset to that of managing the health risk for my son. And this was almost 18 years ago before the age of the internet, before the age of Google. And I just became this rabid researcher. So I had my day job and then I had my night job, which was trying to find a solution for my son's current state of health. And I sought out doctors and family members and friends with children that might have had some success. And I just went to the library and research and research and literally on my kitchen table with books piled higher than I could see one evening, I had an epiphany and it was, oh my goodness, it's what we're feeding him. And the toxins and poisons that are being put into this little body, all the antibiotics and bronchial dilators and steroids and growth hormones, it was just literally breaking him down. And I changed the way he ate. We looked at some adrenal supportive supplements and within five days he started shifting. And fast forward, he's now 23. A boy that we were told would never go past five foot four and would have brain seizures ended up being a gold medalist at the Junior Olympics in karate. He achieved academic heights by getting a full academic grade at a public Ivy. He was the valediction speaker at a school. He's an accomplished musician. He just graduated from University of Virginia and I couldn't be prouder of him. It's been so fun to watch his trajectory even the last couple of years. I had no idea that he had been so sick and that they were so concerned about his physical and health well-being. There's nothing like helping your children to really become that warrior mama, right? Indeed. When, when, oh my goodness. I love that story. And no wonder you are so passionate about what you do. And so I take it that when you were figuring out what to do with your son, you started, I'm assuming, doing more and more research and what brought on the Wildarian movement? Because not only is this a movement, but you have a book coming out and there's a lot of, and this is your whole philosophy in wellness. It really is. And I've now been in private practice for almost 15 years. And part of our practice, it is an educational based practice. And I have a scientist on my staff that used to be at the National Institutes of Health as a genetic specialist. And so fast forward to about five years ago, my daughter became very desperately ill. She had a botched wisdom tooth extraction and she went septic to the brain. And the antibiotic mm. that saved her life gave her C. diff. And then nine months later on a track as a pre-professional ballerina at a ballet conservatory, she was given the wrong supplement for five weeks and she became liver toxic, went into liver shock and almost died. And at that point, she became seriously ill. Her endocrine system became completely dysregulated. I took her to Beyond the Washington, D.C. area, I took her to specialists across the country, and no one could seem to help her. Her hair was falling out. She stopped mincing. Her insulin levels were through the roof. Her body temperature was dangerously low. She couldn't stand up straight. She was really, really ill. And that's when I started exploring genes and how genes are affected by toxins. And what we found was that certain foods and toxins will trip our genes. And so the wildatarian movement came about from our research that showed that certain proteins that are truncated or aberrant contained in traditionally raised animals because of their crowding conditions and their antibiotics and their hormones were actually feeding, in my daughter's case, the pathogens of the C. diff. And she also developed a terrible staph infection. And then she had candida. She had Epstein-Barr. So all of those viruses and pathogens, which were so virulent for her because of her liver toxicity and because of the antibiotic that uh, disrupted her gut biome, they had expressed her genes. And because she had such candida, I was feeding her a very high protein diet, but it was the wrong kind of protein. And she was getting sicker and sicker. And so through our research, we have now found that this whole wild atarian diet, we need to be low amyloid because amyloids will feed the viruses. And also, we not only need to be gluten-free, but we need to be low mycotoxin gluten-free with our grains and our legumes. And what we have found are mycotoxins are metabolites of fungi. And those will be fire starters to strep and candida and staph. And so the diet that I was feeding her was really exacerbating her symptoms rather than helping to resolve her symptoms. 
And so when we put her on a low fat, low sulfur, wild vegetarian diet, she really started improving. And now she's dancing beautifully at Duke and she's, you know, her health is back and we're very, very pleased. And so we have really been so excited to talk about this whole wild vegetarian diet because I believe we have stumbled onto some real groundbreaking discoveries about our food supply and how it's potentially hurting us. I would love for you to dive a little bit in. And one, I'm so grateful to hear that your daughter is doing better. I know she's thriving. She's so beautiful as well. But what Thank are you. some of the things that you had discovered that really shocked you, that really made this movement so important? Well, the, the big thing was I called them the big three, protein and sulfur and stress. Stress being our fat hormone of epinephrine. And so what we're finding is I believe we're becoming a protein malabsorbed, a fat malabsorbed, and a stress-oriented society that is literally tripping our genes to be expressed against our favor and is making us sick. And amyloids in particular, which are these, again, these truncated proteins, are now responsible for contributing to 50 major health conditions in our country, including diabetes, kidney disease, mental health, autoimmune disorders. It's unbelievable. And Stephanie Senev, who is a professor at MIT, who is a biochemist, has done just incredible research on the dangers of the herbicide Roundup, which is bountifully sprayed on our crops every year. Half a billion tons of Roundup are sprayed on our crops every year. And why this Roundup is so deleterious, it is because it stops our body's ability to process proteins, which are necessary for tendons and ligaments and hormones, because proteins break down into amino acids in the body, and then they're repacked to form all those things I just mentioned. And then the glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup, stops our body's ability to process sulfur. And so sulfur has been linked to mental health conditions, to endocrine disorders, to the breaking down of our collagen matrix, and it's been linked to a leaky gut. And so this glyphosate is really a devil in our food supply, making us sulfur malabsorbed and protein malabsorbed. And therefore, we're not able to assimilate and we're getting a leaky gut. What's so scary is that when we're protein malabsorbed, we know that vaccines are live proteins. And now we know, Marissa, that this is so scary. One in 26 boys are at risk for becoming autistic, these little kids. That is an epidemic. One in three children born after the year 2000 is at risk for diabetes. That is an epidemic. One in four children is on some level of antidepressant or anti-anxiety or ADHD medication. We have 4% of the world's population, and we dispense 70% of the world's ADHD medication. Something is very wrong with this picture. Absolutely. You're 100% correct. I mean, and then if we just take a look at the pharmaceuticals that are being recommended, we, we're consuming well over 50% of the medications worldwide. <laughs> We are. And, <laughs> not, and, just, not just the ADHD drugs. I mean, goodness gracious. We are by far the biggest consumer of pharmaceuticals. And you know, something that's really interestingly scary is that 83% of the antibiotic use in this country goes to feed our cattle and our meat supply. That's why we were becoming more and more resistant to antibiotic strains being further fueled by the amyloids, which are these aberrant protein structures that are resulting from crowning conditions. My scientists today, as we're putting literally the last notes on our manuscript for the wild vegetarian diet, found a study at, a, I believe, Michigan State University that these little ducks that were so happy, they were put into crowded spaces for six months. 71% of the ducks died from amyloid doses, from these amyloids in their bodies that made them ill and killed them. Hmm. It's really, really scary. But we can turn this around. The wild vegetarian lifestyle and diet really speaks to low amyloid, low mycotoxin, low stress life. And we have seen in my clinical practice just these amazing outcomes from MS to infertility to ADHD to cancer even 
if you feed the body what it needs, it will respond. And that also includes our thought processes beyond nutrition again. It's so interesting. I, I want to dive in a little bit more, but I was just on the phone with my mom the other day and I have talked about you and my mom is just like, we have to go and see her. <laughs> and so my mom in particular, you know, one of the things that she's dealing with, so funny, I'm making this a little personal. I never do this, but I wanted to just tie the subject. Her biggest concern, she's had severe hormone issues, estrogen dominance due to toxicity, mm-hmm. and she has hormone driven weight resistance. And so really her thing, right? We're, she's so excited to come and see you is she wants to know, what it is that she can eat or not eat because she's had such little success. I mean, this is a woman who runs marathons, half marathons. She works out every week. She's an avid tennis player, super, I mean, real, I mean, she does love her sugar. I'm not going to lie. But all <laughs> in all, for the most part, she is really on top of how she eats. And my goodness, weight does not budge. And so that is a big reason why, why she's so excited to come and see you. So can you tell me a little bit about what you've seen working with women with hormone imbalances? Absolutely. Because clearly this toxicity is, is proliferating against women in hormones. It is. And you know the MTHFR gene expression is a big player there because if we lack methyl donors, and if we have that MTHFR gene expression, and about 90% of the population has at least 25% impairment down to a 75% impairment, which is about a quarter of the population. But if you can't break down, if you have, for example, the C677T polymorphism of the MTHFR gene expression, you're going to recycle estrogen. And so you eating the wrong kind of fats, you're going to be recycling estrogen. Then the the other big thing is insulin is called the fat storage hormone. And with our stress response, which is epinephrine or adrenaline, when we push stress, the body responds because we've just basically what I call cupcake because I'm calling stress a cupcake because it's a fat and a sugar. The adrenaline is the sugar and the neurohormone of adrenaline or epinephrine is the fat. When that happens, the body immediately responds through an insulin response. Well, when we over-secrete insulin that isn't really necessary, we're going to store it as fat because it is a fat storage hormone. And is that why we get the muffin top? Exactly. Terry? That's why I call it the, the it's cupcake. Like a cupcake muffin top. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's not funny, but I'm connecting the dots. But it's, that's exactly right. You've just connected the dots. And so stress is making us bigger and hormone malabsorbed. And so what we know about epinephrine, what's so deleterious about this, especially if we have the MTHFR gene expression, because we're going to recycle estrogen. And estrogen is going to ping off of insulin and estrogen and insulin, guess what they do? They bind to the th- to the cells. And even though if you're making thyroid hormone, it's called the thyroid binding globulin. And you can no longer bring in those thyroid hormones into your cells. And Hmm. so you can't metabolize. Your metabolic function is slowed. Oh, goodness. Some of these things, a lot of listeners may not understand all of it, but I'm just going to break some of it down. I mean, not only are we seeing a high level of estrogen and hormones inside of the meat that we're consuming, we're consuming that. And depending if we have this genetic mutation going on in the body, which so many women do, not only are we feeding this estrogen hormone just from eating the food, slathering the lotion, doing all the things, but we're continuing. And then if we've got gut issues, let's say constipation, we're reabsorbing there anyway, because the colon, we're we're consistently over and over and over again reabsorbing this estrogen. And then you add the stress component, which what woman is not stressed? I mean, if you want to know the number one reason why my mama is struggling, and I know because I'm my mother's daughter, it's the stress, right? And she is using, you know, she's using sugar for energy, or she's using it because she wants to mitigate the stress levels that she's dealing with, right? And so we really have a catch-22 here. We do. Where... (laughs) We do. And the the reason why she's using sugar is she's more than likely going hypoglycemic because she has a stress response and then the body pushes a rush of insulin and all of a sudden you're going loopy and you're like, I got to get myself some sugar or I'm going to pass out. Totally. And you feel exhausted. Yep. Yeah. I mean, I know she is so excited. I know one of the things that you do a lot in your clinic is you do the genetic testing and really get clear on what's going on with the body, what the body expresses, what it's not. But I know that not everyone has that ability to get genetically tested. And that's why I'm so excited about this book. So let me understand, will this diet, even if people don't have the genetic testing, will it work for anyone and everyone reading the book? Let's be honest, each individual is so different than the other person. Yes, absolutely. What I'm so excited about is 
is that based on all the research over 10 years that I've really delved into research, with the wild vegetarian diet, it is a bio-individualized diet, meaning that we have developed a quiz and body talk is really important to us in discerning what the body is telling us. The body is so intelligent. And so it tells us all this information. We just don't, we're not fluent in that language. As wild vegetarians, you're going to be fluent in body talk. And so by taking the quiz, you're going to find out which type of wild vegetarian you are. And I've established four major archetypes of wild vegetarian. One is the basic wild vegetarian where you just can't process protein. And let me tell you, these birds and meats with these aberrant proteins, unless you have zero methylation issues and you're, you're producing hydrochloric acid and you have no stress, you're going to be taxing your system with your traditional animal meat. And then the second thing is the low sulfur wild vegetarian. And then the third thing is a low fat wild vegetarian. And the fourth one is a low fat, low sulfur wild vegetarian. So how do you know? And I'm just going to give your audience just a, a few simple body talk translators, if you will, so they can start thinking about, hmm, what type of wild vegetarian might I be? Well, if you have trouble building muscle, if you get lightheaded a lot, if you burp after eating, if you have bloating after eating, if you have protein in your urine from a lab report, you are not breaking down protein. Sulfur malabsorption would be if you have asthma, if you get sick at salad bars, if you have ADHD, if you have ulcerative colitis or Crohn's, you more than likely have sulfur processing issues. And certain healthy foods like broccoli and cabbage and that ever popular kale could be expressing your genes against your favor. And then the third thing is if you're fat malabsorbed, you will see a loose stool, a floating stool, you might have acne, hormone issues, you get foggy headed, you have bumps on the back of your arms. So those are clear telltale signs. Also, if you have your gallbladder removed, that you might have fat malabsorption. And if you have a combination of the three, then you could be that low fat, low sulfur wild vegetarian or any of the various iterations. So our book and program, the Heal and Seal program, will take you through what to do, how to eat, how to live and think and have this abundant based intentional approach to food and mood. <laughs> I love it. I wanted to ask a little bit more about the book too. Do you have recipes in the book? What else can, because clearly we're able to, in the book and with the quiz, we'll be able to identify which wild vegetarian we're going to be, which is awesome. Exactly. But then also, are there, just curious to know, I'm assuming, cause, you know, we're talking about going beyond the food. So there's going to be a lot of the other lifestyle shifts that you'll tie into that as well. But I also, I'm assuming there's going to be meal plans or at least meal recommendations because not everyone's going to know what sulfur driven foods are. And so I'm assuming there's like lists of like, okay, these are no-nos for, for this particular exactly. person. Exactly. And so in the book, we have over 30 recipes and there is a key that adapts the recipe with simple substitutions based on the type of wild vegetarian you are. And the book gives you guidelines on, you know, what are the worst sulfur foods offenders? Like egg yolk is a big pure sulfur ball. Garlic is, is high sulfur. And so for the rebalancing phase of your program, of the Heal and Seal program, you're going to stay away from those foods. You know, similarly, if you're a low fat wild vegetarian, you're not going to be consuming a lot of cashews or even nuts during the rebalancing phase. You're going to be focusing on, on really low fat seeds. But the Heal and Seal program goes way and dives really deep. And we have webinars and we're going to do live Facebook within the closed community of the wild vegetarian Facebook. And we're going to have weekly wild Wednesdays and we're going to go this is how I ate. This is how I felt. This is how I thought. This is how I felt. This toxin came into my existence and this was the outcome. And so we're really going to dive deep into really unpacking and educating. One of my biggest tenets is education is powerful. And when we come from a place of making an informed decision, we may decide to have that cupcake, but we're not going to have that cupcake every day, whether it's a stress cupcake in the way we think or a real cupcake in how we eat. And when we're coming at it, from an informed perspective, we're in control. 
And that is huge. I love it. It's so true. And the stress is such a major player. And not only are we aligned in so much of the work you do, but you even recommend essential oils. You do recommend a lot of other modalities and tool sets to really help your patients get back on track, which always excites me. (laughs) I absolutely do. You know, I love lavender on the pulse points, a lavender oil on the pulse points to help just calm the system or put it a little bit in water in your bath or even in a little bit of hot water to to drink. Rose oil, if you want to try to elevate your vibration, rose is one of the highest vibrating flowers in the flower kingdom. Geranium and gardenia, my very favorite, it's the flower of the angels. So it is so beautiful. It's my mom's favorite too. (laughs) Oh, I love it. That's my favorite flower. And so if you want to ground, you have sandalwood oil. Uh, tea tree oil is amazing as an antimicrobial and antifungal. Oh my goodness, my kids never got lice during their entire school, 12 years in school, because every morning I had tea tree oil that I had in water and a diffuser, and they would line up and I would spray their hair and their hats and their backpacks. I love it. That's so true. Oh my goodness. I mean, tea tree oil, so many, so many facets and benefits. We use that oil all of the time, like pretty much daily. I love that oil. As do I. I love it. And I take it with me when I travel. And if I feel like the hotel room I may be staying in has got a little bit of a musty smell, I will diffuse tea tree oil in the room. I'll even carry a cheesecloth and put it on the return vent to help minimize that mold. It's so true. The mold and so often they're pumping some nasty synthetic fragrance into those rooms. So we never we never leave home without a diffuser because we travel a lot just like you. And sometimes we're in these hotel rooms and I don't know what they're spraying or what they're using in their, their chemicals to clean the rooms, but it is goodness, it is awful. It's awful. And so tea tree and lemon, those are two oils we tend to diffuse the first day where we're staying at a hotel. That's wonderful. And I love frankincense as well because it's so broad spectrum, antimicrobial, anti-everything. Oh, I love it. I love, love, love it. I love that you're using essential oils. And I know I'm so grateful to hear because I mean, this is that beyond food conversation where there's so much that is at play here. And as you talked about, you know, I, I can't get the cupcake stressor analogy out of my head. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I avoid cupcake, cupcakes like the plague, but literally the level of stress that I can experience in a week, I'm probably consuming like 10 of those cupcakes. I don't even eat Cupcakes. We call it cupcaking yourself. <laughs> You're cupcaking oh my gosh, yourself I love it. Response. Oh my gosh, my mom's going to crack up when she hears this. <laughs> So it's important that we get the book because it's going to really lay the groundwork. I mean, because not everyone can make it to the clinic, right? Right. I know you are, goodness, you have a waiting list of people who are trying to get in to see you over there in DC. So what other tips do you have, take home tips that we can really bring to the listeners today? Well, I really think again, back to the stress, you know, and stress is everything. And I will tell you what we have found about stress. Not only will it make us bigger and have a muffin top, we have now the research that shows it will turn on viruses that have been hanging out in our body because we got viruses, we have bacteria, but literally stress is our fire starter. It will leak our gut and it will turn on viruses. And just to share a little bit of my personal experience, this past summer, I've been going through a life transition and the stress literally almost killed me because I turned on in my body. I'm, I'm a very healthy woman. And you are absolutely. I mean, when you got that sick, I was so worried and I knew it was stress that had crippled you. I just knew it. Absolutely. It was all stress. I reignited seven different viruses in my body in three strands of Lyme and it was all stress. And when I was able to unpack that, that's what made me realize and find the literature. I'm like, what happened? I was fine yesterday and I can't raise my hand today because I ended up with neuropathy, liver damage and brain encephalitis. And so I cannot emphasize enough how deleteriously destructive stress is. And so what I leave for your listeners is every thought we think has a wave pattern. That wave pattern has an expression and outcome in our body, which then results in a diminished state of health or an increased state of health. They've done Mm -hmm. studies out of University of Pennsylvania, I believe, that say when we think and have negative thought patterns, we can reduce our immune system by up to 50% for up to five hours. That is impressively scary. Conversely, when we entertain thoughts of love and joy and compassion and gratitude and laughter, just the opposite happens. We can increase our immune system by up to 50% for up to five hours. So 
my new saying is the thought creates the thing. If we're thinking about abundant type living, about living with people that we surround ourselves by that give us joy and laughter and gratitude versus the other, if we consume only that which serves our highest purpose, we cannot intersect with disease because we will be vibrating at a rate that does not resonate with disease. I swear you are a sister from another mother. We are so (laughs) aligned in everything. And there's so much, I mean, I think the big, big takeaway, not only do you have a plan that has served thousands and thousands of people, but that you are, you are pinpointing one of our biggest, biggest issues, you know, particularly women, which is who this audience is. And that big takeaway about what we're thinking absolutely translates. We have molecules of emotion Mm -hmm. and, you know, I used to be chronically sick all of the time, strep throat, viruses, name it. And it was always driven by stress. Always. I was reactivating viruses left and right. And it wasn't until I started really getting under control that that I started healing and changing the way that I thought. Not only what I was putting in my body, putting on my body, but how I was thinking the thoughts that I wasn't continuing to eat these cupcakes every day. Right. Um, <laughs> theoretically, <laughs> these cupcakes. I didn't even get to enjoy the cupcake. you know. And so I wanted to ask you this one more question. Everyone has got to go and grab your books. I know it's going to be a huge eye-opener for them. But I I love asking this question. And I wanted to know, what is the one thing, because you being this this amazing, well-researched, you know, woman who is super healthy in your body, what is the one daily habit, or it could be a natural solution that you are doing on a day-to-day basis that is really moving the needle to your well-being and health? Two things. And one is, again, back to the thought creates a thing is I get up and the first thing I think about is what am I grateful for? Because it's going to set my intention for that day, and it's going to calibrate my energetic field. And so I I think of something that makes me happy, and it can be grateful. I'm grateful that I'm just getting to watch this beautiful sunrise out my window, or that my daughter is going to be coming home this weekend, or you know what, that I'm going to have this yummy dinner with my son tonight. It doesn't have to be, I'm going to Fiji. So we can be grateful for the small things. And, and Mark Nepo, which is one of my favorite philosophers, says that life is made up of a string of moments. And so in the present moment is where the joy and gratitude can reside. Mm-hmm. So that is one thing. And I think that's hugely important. The second thing is, you know, our livers, because we're toxic, because of our environment, and even the thoughts we think in the, the stress environment, you know, I deal with very complex health issues. I start my morning with a detoxification juice of cilantro and cucumber and apple cider vinegar. And that is just so refreshing. I literally feel like I am fully awake. And when I travel, I take apple cider vinegar with me in a little glass jar and I drink it with water. I don't have my green juice unless I can avail myself of that, but I'm always drinking apple cider vinegar because it's an alkalizer. It's a prebiotic. It helps with digestive enzymes. It helps with the production of hydrochloric acid. So I do not leave home without my apple cider vinegar. I love it. And that is such an easy takeaway for so many people. And you're right. It is an alkalizer. We add it to our green juice every morning too. So I love it. Again, we're just so aligned. (laughs) And then you also have the most amazing freebie one. I just like the way it's called and it's the Fab Five and that is five favorites for home and away. So I'm assuming apple cider vinegar is on that Fab Five list. It sure is. Absolutely. Okay. Tell us a little bit about this wonderful gift for everyone to grab. Yeah. So the Fab Five is my top for you can't be home without and you can't leave home without. And these are just these amazing helpers that I detail why they're so important. Again, apple cider vinegar, I just described charcoal it is the best anti-poison around. You know, hospitals will activated charcoal, just carrying a, a few activated charcoals in your purse because you never know if you're going to catch some parasite that, from that great sushi you had. The next thing is coconut oil. Coconut oil, oh my gosh, it is a tooth whitener. It's an antimicrobial. I put it on my skin as an, an emulsifier and a hormone balancer, and it's great for the thyroid because of its lauric acid qualities. And then I love tea tree oil, as I talked about, Mm-hmm. You essential know, so, oil woo-woo. yes mm-hmm. yes so and then the last thing is arnica you know i'm always running from a to b to c in fast motion and arnica is an amazing anti-inflammatory and it also for bruising it's incredible so these are just these amazing five things that every person mother child 
man should have. And I always tell all of my athletes, do not leave home without Arnica in your bag because you're going to bruise yourself in a concussion. So many studies have been done on the powers of Arnica in reducing the healing time in concussions. I love it. Oh my goodness. I know it. We're going to have everyone grab that. You guys know what's in the show notes. You're going to need to grab that freebie. And I mean, you're going to be absolutely prepared. Harry, honey, you have come with a wealth of information. This has been such a fun interview. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, it's been so fun. Thanks for having me. Absolutely, honey. Talk soon. All righty. I hope you learned as much as I did in that short amount of time with Terry. I feel like I could have picked her brain for hours on end. One of the things I am most excited about is how she's able to take her countless years of research and working with individual patients and turn it into the Wildarian lifestyle and nutrition plan that anyone can follow. I want to invite you to check out the book and grab Terry's Fab Five favorite for home and away guide that she had created exclusively for you. You can find the link to Terry's gift in the show notes for this episode on my website, drmarisa.com slash episode 15. That's D-R-M-A-R-I-Z-A dot com slash episode and the number 15. Thank you so much for stopping by and listening in on the Essentially You podcast. We are bringing to the kitchen with my amazing friend and fellow hormone expert, Magdalena. Magdalena is part chef, part hormone whisperer, and we are going to explore how to use food to rebalance hormones all in the next episode, so you're not going to want to miss out. Now, also, I would love to hear from you specifically about what you would love to hear more of on the podcast. So take a moment, rate and review the Essentially You podcast on iTunes. That way I can continue to serve you and other incredible women who are ready to become healers in their own home. Talk to you soon. Bye.